Uh, welcome to our talk about uh, Curbeck, a vector analysis. Um, and thank you, Brooklyn, for accepting our talk. Uh, so who are we behind this uh, presentation? Uh, my name is Stian Yar. I'm a senior reverse engineer in Monik. Been in Monik uh, since 2006, uh, doing uh, network analysis and uh, uh, forensics and uh, reverse engineering the latest years. And we, then we have uh, Svein Engen, which is also a reverse engineer in Monik. Been reversing malware for mm, 12 years. Uh, so he's quite experienced, so we're happy to have he on his, our teams. Uh, he was not able to attend the conference this year, unfortunately. And then we have uh, Rafael Lucas Mars, which is uh, joined Mnemonic uh, in 2016, uh, also doing network analysis and uh, IoT uh, sensors, and uh, now is the reverse engineering team lead. So what does the Mnemonic uh, reverse engineering team do. Uh, we, of course, support our uh, SOC with the managed uh, detection and response service. But we also do, uh, also are involved in incident responses uh, when we have that. And we also do a lot of uh, research and development. And this talk is a combination of uh, incident response and uh, research and development. So the agenda for this talk is a brief introduction to what we're going to talk about, uh, how we found the malware and why we find it so interesting that we want to talk to you about it. And uh, then we go to the actual analysis of the malware. And then we're going to talk to you about the command and control that the malware uses. So the background, the origin of the story, is that uh, last fall, the Monik incident response team was engaged to uncover an attack as an espionage campaign. Uh, and the threat actor uh, in this incident was attributed to uh, the China Nexus uh, threat actor, uh, more specifically APT41, uh, which was uh, the conclusion of our analysis and also backed by other, other intelligence partners. And one of the malware they deployed was particularly interesting. Uh, from what we can see, could see, it was a previously undocumented malware uh, in the arsenal of ABT41. Uh, it has uh, similars to Crosswalk and uh, Sidewalk, which is also used by ABT41. So we find that this is so interesting that we want to do a deep analysis of it and, uh, and talk about it. About it. Uh, and during the incident, uh, a lot of servers and clients was uh, compromised uh, you, uh, by the malware we named uh, Curve back, back then. Uh, it is not uncommon to see so many infected servers and clients in large instances like this, but uh, we saw that uh, Curve, back, Curve back was the backdoor they used the most in the incident. So we find very interesting. There was a couple of other uh, malware as well, but uh, this was the, the most uh, used. Uh, so an overview of the components of the backdoor. Uh, we start with the uh, persistent mechanism, uh, which is responsible for keeping uh, uh, the malware persistent on the, on the system and uh, survive the reboots and stuff like that. Uh, which is uh, responsible for uh, executing uh, the uh, loader, which we have named the curve load, uh, which is uh, utilizing delayed side loading uh, and facilitating and decrypting the actual backdoor, uh, which we named the curve back. Uh, this is a modular backdoor, uh, which uh, uses uh, curve to 519 for uh, key negotiation. Uh, that's why we called it curve back. Uh, and the curve load and curve loss is just derived from the name curve back we gave it. And all these uh, components are generally independent by, but related to each other by its configuration. Yeah, and so a bit about the part about it being previously undocumented. Uh, that was the case in June of 2024, uh, this year. However, uh, and by that time, we also presented at the fir annual first conference in Japan, which was great. Um, but uh, next month, uh, in July, uh, Zscaler published a two-series blog post on the same malware. Uh, first one being about uh, Dodgebox, which is the same as Curveload in our case, and then Moonwalk, which is Curveback. A week later, Mandiant published a blog post as well. Um, they, they dubbed the malware Dust Trap. Um, 
And then uh, the following month, uh, Trend Micro also got on the bandwagon and published a blog post on Stealth Reacher and Sneak Cross. Um, so uh, it is not previously undocumented anymore. Uh, I would like to apologize to <laughs> the organizers and the attendees. That was the case when we responded to the CFP, but unfortunately not anymore. But we hope to uh, educate you and give you some new findings anyway. Um, and also a bit back to uh, Michael's great talk uh, about sharing intelligence. Um, we also shared some of our observations with Mand in this world. So uh, that is a part of actually sharing intelligence and notifying uh, others about uh, the threat that it poses. Yeah, so that's about the background. And now we'll dig into the uh, malware analysis. Uh, we start with the curve lust, the, the persistent mechanism. Uh, it, it consists of two uh, files, uh, one file named mscoreee.dll, uh, which is a legitimate uh, file from Microsoft uh, in the .NET environment. Uh, it is slightly modified, uh, we'll get back to that in a second. And the malicious code the threat actor has written, which is named mscoreweekes.dll. Uh, these files are found in this particular folder. Uh, i tell you why in a second. Uh, and they are both signed with a certificate uh, allegedly belong to a Russian travel agency, Alien Tour. And recent versions uh, has been observed to be signed by another uh, stolen uh, outdated certificate. And MS Core E is uh, a core component of the .NET environment. It is resp responsible for bootstrapping and uh, executing a .NET application. Um, so it is loaded uh, whenever a .NET application is uh, executed. Uh, and uh, the replacement of the particular file leads to a delay hijacking of that file. Uh, and that added import to the other malicious uh, file. And MS Core WKS, which is the name they chosen in our incident, uh, is not uh, randomly chosen. Uh, previously, this was uh, a file in uh, MS uh, in .NET uh, prior to uh, .NET 4.0. Uh, in our incident, we observed two versions of uh, this file uh, with uh, different implementations on how they execute the uh, present mechanism. And uh, they had a command line uh, uh, which will execute the loader and the arguments for executing the loader correctly. So whenever it's an application that depends on a specific component of .NET, uh, like for instance this uh, launching PowerShell, uh, it will attempt to load MS Core EE from Windows System 32 where it's supposed to be, but it will also try to load it from this particular folder, which uh, where we found the malicious file. Uh, and uh, this is the case for when I uh, execute the PowerShell. But if, if you just leave your computer on and let it run for a second and do its job, uh, some application will, uh, with uh, uh, enough privilege, will uh, eventually load the malicious file and execute uh, the next steps for the malware. Uh, so the modification they done to this file uh, was uh, small. Uh, they added one section, which they named the H data. Uh, they changed the uh, image size and the uh, PE size accordingly. And they also updated the checksum, which is in invalid for some reason. And uh, the import directory of the file, they, they point to the newly added section. And they also changed the security directory, which points to the uh, certificate they added. Uh, which is uh, in the overlay of the f on the P file. And uh, if we take a deeper dig in the, the um, import directory, uh, we see that the original file contains 126 imports from kernel 32. Uh, uh, but the newly added section uh, import directory uh, points to the same uh, import table, uh, but also added the import for MS Core VKS.dll which means that this uh, file is loaded and executed when someone executed a .NET application. Uh, so the first version we saw uh, executed uh, curl load using uh, WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation. Uh, to facilitate the Windows Management Instrumentation, you need to 
uh, reveal some strings uh, which was uh, encrypted uh, and uh, all the import all, or many imports was uh, hashed so we need to puzzle that up um, but uh, it might be con inconvenient to execute uh, the malware each time someone executed a .NET application. So they have implemented their own uh, mutual uh, inclusion algorithm where they calculate the boot time of the computer and stores that in a file uh, derived from the machine ID. And uh, whenever it executes, it uh, checks that uh, the current executed boot time corresponds with the uh, timestamp stored in the file on disk. And if uh, the difference is larger than uh, plus minus two seconds, it will uh, re-execute. That was the first version. Uh, the second version uh, uh, executed the next step using uh, shadow tasks. And they created the shadow task using directly manipulation of the registries and not using uh, Windows IP to handle shadow tasks. Uh, the task path is part of the configuration, the encrypted uh, configuration in the uh, curve last uh, binary. Uh, and it was set to trigger at system boot time, so you need to wait for a reboot for the actual execution. And they also leave out uh, a register key named security descriptor, which describes the uh, uh, privileges of the uh, who, who can see the task, uh, which means that uh, Nobody uh, with common tools can see the task when you look at it in, in normal tools to look at tasks. And they also add uh, an optional to register a COM handler uh, instead of executing the binary directly. Uh, then they added uh, the, the class ID uh, in the configuration. And uh, to do this, they need to duplicate the trusted installer service, which is a higher privilege than the system user in Windows. Um, so why did yeah? So they they started the trust installer service and uh, and steal the token and elevate to it uh, it writes and uh, that also gave us an IOC to find this malware another infected service. So when you generate a shell task in Windows, uh, this particular uh, task in the registry is uh, manipulated. Uh, in the task cache folder, you create a uh, three, which holds the task name and uh, the path and uh, yeah, what, what ID you should look for. And then you create the actual task or what the task should do in, under the tasks folder. And then they also created a, a section under the boot folder, which means that it will execute when the system reboots. And when we look at the task they created, they, this is, was a handwritten register key where they had some hard-coded values based on the system, the version of the Windows system was running. And they packed the command line and the arguments in the register key, and yeah, which made it a valid and functional task in Windows. When they used uh, a commander, uh, the task would not uh, contain any uh, command line, so it was not that obvious which command line what it, that was executed. They only com uh, contain a binary representation of the um, of the uh, CLS ID uh, and the uh, command line arguments. And then the actual command line was uh, in another uh, folder under the command under the class root folder in uh, the red registry. So when we look at the register, uh, we see that they have created uh, uh, yeah, the two tasks here. Uh, one of them is already there from uh, newly installed in Microsoft Windows system, which is the gather network uh, info. And the analyze network info is the task that the threat actor created. And if you look at uh, tools like uh, uh, Task Shadow, we do not see the Analyze uh, Network Info in that tool. And also other tools like uh, Azure Task or, uh, or uh, PowerShell uh, command line uh, get shadow task will not show the, the actual task that the uh, threat actor placed. So uh, that was the uh, persistent mechanism. 
Uh, and then uh, some words about the loader. The loader itself is pretty well documented by the other blog post we have uh, mentioned. Uh, so we're not going to the deep details of the loader uh, this time. Uh, it consists of two, uh, three components. Uh, one uh, legitimate file from Microsoft, which is the anti-kernel debugger. This is an unmodified version of it, so this is the pure version of it. Uh, this file is dependent on dbg-eng.dll, uh, which the uh, threat actor have uh, sideloaded uh, and written, uh, written their own code for the loader. And this uh, file is facilitating uh, for decryption and uh, executing the actual backdoor. And uh, they have obfuscated command line arguments, which is checked. And, uh, uh, if it's not, if you don't, don't run it with the command, uh, correct command line, you will not execute correctly. And it contains the, where the payload loca is located on the disk, uh, offset uh, in the payload and size, and integrity checks and uh, encryption parameters. And also some uh, miscellaneous behavioral uh, uh, parameters like pebble linking and self-deletion. And it uh, executes uh, the backdoor using uh, CFG bypass and DLL Halloween. And uh, this uh, file is uh, similar to uh, Stealth Vector, uh, which is the loader for uh, Scramble Cross, which is uh, described in a previous blog post by Trend Micro. And the uh, recent versions uh, have been observed to re encrypt the payload using an IV derived from the machine uh, GUID. Yeah, so that concludes our uh, presentation about uh, curve load as well, and going into the actual backdoor, which is curve back. Um, so curve back in itself is loaded, is stored as an encrypted blob on disk, but if you are actually able to decrypt it, you will get a completely um, clean .exe file. And the .exe file itself um, uh, contains code, naturally, but also has a few embedded parts, like an uh, encrypted configuration, a cryptography module, and a network module. Um, the core part of uh, Curveback is actually more of a framework for command dispatching and module coordination. Um, and all the actual backdoor functionality is implemented in the modules that it, that it loads using the LL hollowing as well. The encrypted configuration contains parameters for the core part as well as the embedded modules. Um, and uh, once the embedded modules and configuration are loaded into memory, it starts by retrieving commands from the C2. It employs several offensive techniques to thwart both analysis and, uh, and, det and uh, detection, uh, such as API hashing, indirect syscalls, and EDR hook bypass. Um, and also notably, recent versions uh, have been observed to use the Windows, uh, Windows Fiber Fibers API. However, we don't, did not see that in our sample. And a bit about DLL hollowing, um, which is a technique to load additional code into a process memory. Uh, usually not that interesting, but it is interesting because of two things. The part one being that it is used, it is used the exact same implementation. It's used both in curve load and in curve back. Um, and secondly, it has a few uh, possible IOCs. So it starts by finding a candidate or sacrificial DLL, and it does that by searching for DLLs in the system directory. Uh, and it wants to find a DLL that is compatible with the actual payload, um, but there are a few uh, DLLs that are excluded. There is a hard-coded list of 58 file names. And the list itself is identical in curve load and in curve back, and even in stealth vector. Uh, and when I say it is identical, it is not only the same list. I mean, like, it is verbatim identical. It is the exactly same list with the, in its ex exactly same order and with the sa same case sensitivity as well. So what is, once it has found uh, a sacrificial DLL that it can use, um, it will try to determine the hollow DLL path. And it does that by trying to write a file uh, to a privileged directory. And if it's successful, it will use the first directory. And if it's unsuccessful, it will use the other one, which requires less pr privileges. A notable thing about the directory that they are using, I mean the final directory that they are using, um, it resembles uh, legitimate subdirectories that you would find on a clean system. However, uh, a legitimate subdirectory will use double underscores in parts of the uh, folder name, uh, while they have used only a single one. So that is like one of the ways that you can possibly search for uh, possible use of either curve load or curve back. 
And once it has determined the hollow DLL path, it will copy the DLL from uh, the legitimate DLL from the system directory to the hollow DLL path. Then it will actually hollow the DLL and load the module into the process memory. And it does that by preparing it by writing the malicious payload to uh, the copied file. Um, it will then use it, the loaded into actual memory by using uh, anti create section and anti map view of section such that it resembles a legitimate. Uh, library in process memory, and then finally clean it up by copying the legitimate DLL from the system directory uh, or the contents of it back to the one that is hollowed, such that the file on disk does not actually contain the payload anymore. It will be identical to the one in the system directory. And if you want to actually figure out if it's uh, malicious or not, you have to compare it with what it's, what's in memory. Um, we haven't been able to find the actual implementation anywhere else, like at least identically, but uh, as far as we can gather, it, is, it seems to be inspired by a, a great technique uh, blocked by uh, Forrest Orr, which is called Phantom DLL Hollowing. Um, it has a lot of similarities, or at least some of the same properties once it's done. Um, however, it is detectable by Hollow Center and PEC. Yeah. Or to you. So uh, the modules, uh, the core module is just facilitating uh, communication between the modules itself. Uh, so the modules consist of uh, three enumerated module types, one, two, and three. Uh, so module three types uh, is responsible for the cryptography, where they implement the uh, symmetric and asymmetric encryption algorithms and hashing. And this is necessarily to communicate for communicating with the command control server. So this is uh, this module is embedded in the backdoor, uh, and we have only seen one uh, versions of Type Three, which uh, implements Curve Two Five Five Nineteen for key negotiation. And then the uh, net network uh, module Type Two is the responsible for the network, uh, which is. Uh, uh, needed for communicating with the command and control. Uh, so this is also a module that is embedded in the back door. Uh, in our incident, uh, we saw that they use uh, Google Drive and other uh, reporters have also said that the Google Drive is, uh, is used. Uh, but uh, hunting uh, virus total, we also found one uh, sample that was using uh, HTTPS for communication, uh, which is a public sample. Uh, and the module type one is the general module, which implements the actual functionality of the backdoor, like process execution, file system operation, uh, RDP session listing, uh, relaying, and the screenshot, and whatever. Uh, and these modules uh, are uh, downloaded from the command control when needed, and not stored in memory in ClearText. It is encrypted. Uh, so just having a process dump, which I recommend everyone to do when they do instant response. Uh, we do it a lot when they do instant response, so we are likely to extract some of the modules by that. Uh, and the compilation timestamps of the modules uh, cons coincides with the incident timeline, which means that the threat actor uh, was able to uh, update the modules during the incident and also made some changes to the modules uh, while the incident uh, was ongoing. Um, so uh, to extract the modules, uh, from our anal analysis, we learned that the uh, modules was stored in the memory process uh, memory, pro uh, process memory uh, in a circular doubly linked list uh, in uh, for uh, yeah, yeah, as this structure, you have an ID, a type, uh, the size of the uh, module, and then you have a pointer to the encrypted version of uh, of the module, and then a pointer to the next uh, next module in list. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, encrypted module uh, structure contains uh, key material uh, and the size and the uh, actual uh, encrypted module. Um, and uh, when you have loaded one entry in, uh, in an affected, in affected this, uh, machine, it was not uh, automatically removed unless you asked, uh, asked the backdoor to remove it, which made us able to extract process dumps. So uh, we knew uh, one of the models, which was the Google Drive module. We knew the ID and the uh, type, 
and the size of it. So we was able to uh, find where the Google Drive module was in the memory. And then we could follow each, uh, follow the linked list uh, and uh, use the key material and decrypt every module. And then we got uh, file, nice PE files uh, for each modules. Uh, and uh, since we have two different versions of uh, modules uh, with different compilation timestamps, we did um, uh, comparisons of the modules. Uh, most of the modules uh, has no code change at all. It was just an update for the compilation timestamp. Uh, one of the modules uh, was the, the file operations module, uh, had uh, some uh, no functional changes, but uh, more robust implementation of the, uh, of the modules. Like uh, instead of using uh, path directory, uh, path is directory, they used uh, uh, check the attributes of the file. And uh, in the first version, they also used the sh file uh, operation function, alloc. And uh, in the next version, they rewrote that function to a recursive function that actually made sure that uh, the, uh, the file has the correct attributes. And they also, uh, one of the modules, uh, which was the module that listed the RDP sessions of an infected server, the first version had uh, the possibility to list uh, uh, RDP sessions on the infected uh, machine, but in the second version, they added the functionality to list RDP sessions on a remote server, which is, might be convenient. Yeah, and um, uh, one of the other modules that we saw was the keylogger module, and it is not that exciting in itself, but um, it has a poor implementation, which might be an easy win for incident responders, which we thought was at least mentionable. So um, the keylogger logs key data, and it stores it on a file on disk. Um, the path is provided there, and the structure for each entry is also provided on the right-hand side, and all of the orange fields are encrypted, so that's the main problem. Uh, they are encrypted with a CBC and a custom obfuscation algorithm that we provided below, which are just hard-coded values. And in order to actually get hold of the keylogger data, you need a AES key. Uh, so the way they actually derive the key is by using the folder name <laughs> that it is stored in. So uh, if you only encode it and then perform MD5, encode it again, and then do crypt derive key from the Windows API, um, you will actually get the AES key that they used and be able to decrypt the keylogger data and get insight into what they have actually collected, which might be nice. Uh, yeah, and if you want to actually do it in practice, uh, you start at offset eight and use the IV zero. So easy PC, once you know the algorithm, um, hopefully and that is uh, helpful to someone. Also, opcodes. Opcodes are not that interesting in itself, but it might be interesting if you are comparing malware families or like evolutionaries uh, or evolutionary um, or like new strains or something. Uh, and in general, the opcodes uh, follow these rules that all requests have a response and the response code is the request code plus one. Uh, however, rules are meant to be broken and that is not always the case. Uh, there are several examples of requests that do not have a response and in some cases that the response code is not the request code plus one. Another thing that is uh, at least nice to know is that uh, for modules of uh, type one, which are the general ones, uh, if you interpret uh, actual opcodes in decimal, they will start with the module ID. So for instance, the first uh, opcode for module nine, which is the host information module, is 901, and the response is 902, and so on. Yeah, and that concludes our part about the malware analysis, and we're going to uh, devote the rest of the talk to command and control. And command and control, I don't think is usually that much talked about, but our mo primary motivation for doing it was to at least perhaps be able to get insight into operator activity. Um, we've done that before and would like to do it again. That is really valuable. Uh, and before I go on, into the actual details, I would like to kind of bring you on to a story. Uh, doing incident response is kind of like an emotional roller coaster. Um, and we were able to acquire some of the actual data that was transferred from the uh, compromised clients and to the C2, and so we wanted to decrypt it naturally. And we saw that there were a lot of references to AES, so we thought that 
either the key has to be embedded into the malware itself, or at least transferred in clear text. However, uh, we figured out that it used elliptic curve cryptography, and so, um, for all practical reasons, impossible. That was until we uh, thought about it a second and figured out that, wait again, we have a few crash and process dumps. They should probably contain key material, which can enable us to actually decrypt the traffic, right? However, that was until we found out that uh, we had the wrong keys. Uh, it turns out that the actual malware uh, negotiates keys for each session. So even though we had some data and even though we had some keys, they didn't match up and we weren't able to actually use it. Um, but examining the crash dumps again, we thought, wait a second, they should also contain some packet data, right? Which might um, uh, show us some of the operator activity. And they should match the key material in those same process dumps as well. But again, uh, a downside, uh, we had the wrong IVs. And it turns out that it doesn't only uh, negotiate new keys for uh, each session, it also renews IVs for each message. And the IV uh, renewal algorithm is very unpredictable. Uh, so that was unfortunate uh, until we found a small quirk. And that was that they used AES CFP. And that is uh, a, cipher, I, a special way to use AES. It's a cipher block mode. Um, and the thing about AES CFP, I won't go into all the details. I'll try to explain it as easily as possible. So, you have some uh, ciphertext, and you have a key, and you have an IV, and you need the key and IV to get the plain text, right? Uh, the thing about CFP is that uh, that is true in general for all cipher block modes that use an IV at least. Um, but in CFP, the IV is only required to get the first plain text block, and all subsequent plain text blocks only uh, rely on the actual ciphertext itself. So even though we had the wrong IV, we could use any IV we wanted, uh, we were able to actually decrypt uh, everything except for the first block. And that enabled us to actually get insight into some of the operator activity, at least from the processes that we had, um, which, was a, which was a win, uh, given that they use ECC. Uh, but we wanted to go further. Uh, we wanted to go further uh, to see if there were actually anything else that we could pro possibly leverage. Um, or just for fun as well. So uh, in general, uh, the command control, uh, it is determined by the actual uh, embedded modules that the malware, uh, that the malware embeds. Um, and there are several, as we have mentioned already. Uh, and in order to track operator activity, you have to also get through several layers of obfuscation. Some of them are easier than the other, on, than other ones. So for instance, compression using LC4, which is a known compression algorithm, uh, usually just means that you have to import a library, run a function, and you're done. And in other parts, such as elliptic curve cryptography, uh, you can basically just give up uh, immediately. There are a few other requirements as well, or at least things you should know about. Um, you require um, um, a hard-coded client-server pinning key. Uh, which is located in curve by configuration, and in the next slides you'll understand why. Uh, and it's also that the keys are negotiated for each session and that the IV is renewed for each message, which is the, yeah, hard details. So on a high level description, um, we've tried to describe both protocol, uh, network protocols, both the HTTP and the Google Drive one. So in the case of HTTP, um, there are templates in the curve by configuration. I mean, like there's a C2 server as well, but uh, in order to understand the traffic itself, there are templates that describe uh, which URLs and some HTML templates as well that are used. Um, and the message structure itself is uh, divided into two parts. You have a metadata, uh, which contain, contains the session ID and some other stuff. And then you have the payload, which is the actually encrypted message. For the client communicating with the C2 server, you can do that in two ways, depending on the message size. So uh, is either a GET request or a POST request uh, to a specific URL. Uh, and if it's a GET request, the actual data is encoded into the cookie header uh, value. And if it's a POST request, it is, it is in an HTTP body, in an HTTP template there. For the server part, um, it only responds with HTTP 200. And the message is always encoded into the HTTP body. For Google Drive, uh, that C2 uh, channel works by, by the, both the client and the server uh, uploading and downloading files to a Google Drive account. 
and the credentials are stored in the curveback configuration. So it starts by the client uploading its public key to a specific folder designating the session ID. Um, the server downloads that uh, public key, does some calculations, and uploads its public key. And by then, I mean, like, this client downloads that one as well. And by then, the session is established. And they have separate folders uh, for, I mean, like, below the session ID folder, which they use for communicating with each other. Going down another level, uh, so in order to actually uh, send messages back and forth, you have to uh, do some key exchange. But before doing key exchange, you have to do uh, negotiate a session, session ID. So in the case of HTTP, you have uh, metadata uh, where that is, that is designated. Um, you have some other stuff as well, but the session ID is the, perhaps the most important one. Um, it is XOR, but the XOR key is already there, so that's not a big deal. Uh, as for Google Drive, uh, that is in the session folder or the folder name that, that is used. When it comes to the actual key exchange, um, for HTTP, they use this struct on the right-hand side, uh, where you can see that they have several fields. Um, the most interesting ones are, of course, you have to need the public key. Uh, you also need an IV, but they use different IVs depending on which direction you're going. Uh, and you also have a host hash, which is uh, just a binary value in uniquely identifying the actual host. And we'll get back to why that is interesting. When it comes to Google Drive, uh, they use a similar structure. So you can see that the key exchange structure is embedded into the structure, but uh, it is prepended with sequence number. And depending on the direction, also perhaps, uh, possibly some junk bytes. And once they have, oh yeah, and I forgot. Uh, so as you can see, the key exchange structure as well, you can see that the public key and some other values are XORed, and they use the uh, XORed key that I mentioned on the previous slide. Yeah, and once they have uh, actually performed the key exchange, they will have a shared secret. And if you XOR that shared secret with the XOR key that has already been used once, uh, so now twice, you get the actual AES key that you use for encryption. So the messages. I'm sorry, I just need some water. So after key negotiation, uh, you want to actually exchange messages. And the message structure can be separated into three, at least three logical parts. The first one being a validation part. So you have the topmost fields, the compression, compressed size, integrity, and is compressed, um, which are just used for validation. And then you have the message data, which is used for dispatching. Uh, and then finally, you have the payload, which is at the bottom of the message data, which is the actual contents of the message that is sent. Everything in the message structure, except for the compressed size, is encrypted with uh, the negotiated key and the IV, uh, depending on the direction. And uh, back to the host hashes that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, this is where it gets interesting, at least we thought it was. Um, depending on the direction in which the message goes, so if it's a message from a compromised client to the server, it will only contain one host, one host hash, which identifies the origin of the message. However, if it's a message from the server to the client, uh, it has a substructure which designates a count and an array of different host hashes. And the reason for that is that they have built in into the core part of Curveback uh, a way to relay messages between infected client, clients. So if you have a client that is infected in the DMC, uh, that is all right. But if you have another uh, host that you want to compromise uh, deeper into the network that is not, does, does not have uh, direct internet access, you can do that as well and relay messages via the host in the DMC. And the payload structure, um, that depends on the opcode and the module ID. Uh, we'll get back to that in the next slide. Uh, however, for Google Drive, uh, we see that it is basically the same structure as for HTTP, uh, except that it has a sequence number uh, and some junk bytes uh, prepended. And then finally, to the payload, as I mentioned, it depends highly on the opcode and the module ID. And uh, going through all opcodes would be way out of scope for this presentation. Uh, however, we have provided a simple example for completeness. Um, so given, let's say you want to get the system boot time, you need to have the module number nine loaded into process memory, and uh, you have to send uh, um, a request for opcode 909. Uh, because you're not actually, there are no arguments to getting the system boot time, so the, pay, the actual payload is empty. 
In the response, you'll get uh, a simple, but yet a structure. Uh, the first, the word designating whether it was a success or a failure. And then a string in its size, uh, which says like the system boot time is 2024.09.11, blah, blah, blah. So that is how that works. And there's a lot of work going, <laughs> getting all this way. Uh, and one might ask why. I've already alluded to one of the uh, applications that we've uh, at least attempted to do. Um, and that is tracking operator activity. Given all the knowledge that we have now, we, ha we weren't able to actually find any new vulnerabilities that we could use or anything, but uh, given what we know now, we, can, uh, we know that it is possible, but it is quite difficult given the technical requirements that is necessary to actually do it. So in order to track operator activity, you need a few different parts. Um, you need to get hold of the actual data, and in addition to being encrypted with, uh, by the backdoor itself, it is often also encapsulated in TLS. So the most general way to actually get hold of the TLS unencrypted data is to have a TLS decryption in your environment, which I think most do not have. Um, secondly, you need an AES key to be able to actually decrypt the traffic, and that is the one that is negotiated using elliptic curve cryptography. We have not broken elliptic curve cryptography, but you might be able to take process dumps. Uh, however, you have to take process dumps during uh, the session. Uh, once it's done, the key will probably be gone, and that data is lost. Then you need the XOR key from the curveback configuration, which I mentioned uh, several times previously. Uh, you can get that from the encrypted payload on disk if you're able to decrypt it. Um, and if not, you always have the process dumps as well. It is there, uh, so that's nice. And then finally, you need the IV. Um, and in order to get the IV, uh, you can actually get it from the key negotiation. You get the initial IV. And if you have all the other parts, um, you can use the TLS decrypted data together with the XOR key from the curveback configuration and deduce the next ones. So as long as you at least get the initial one, uh, you're good. And as long as you're actually able to decrypt traffic. Uh, we also have a few other applications, uh, one of them being C2 hijacking. So C2 hijacking, what you basically want to achieve is to uh, hijack the C2 sessions. I mean, like whenever the client tries to contact the C2 server, you want to hijack that uh, request. Um, and the reason for why you want to do that is perhaps if you do not have a complete coverage of your environment and you're actually interested in which clients are uh, in my environment are actually infected. So what you want to do is to hijack, uh, intercept the traffic, and negotiate your own keys. And that is possibly more feasible than uh, tracking operator activity. Um, you can decide yourself. Uh, what you need is always the XOR key from the curveback configuration. And you also need a C2 server implementation. Not a complete one, though. The only thing you actually need is to perform key negotiation and then the decrypt the first message that the client sends. Then you'll get host information. <clears throat> Doing that for HTTP, uh, you can do that easily by rerouting traffic to your own C2 server, which is nice. However, for Google Drive, that is a bit more complicated, uh, possibly even illegal, depending on where you are. But um, you have the credentials in the curveback configuration, and you can use that to register a watcher in the Google Drive API, which notifies you whenever a file is uploaded. The key thing is that um, when the client uploads its key negotiate, the, its public key, there will be a delay between the server actually intercept, I mean, like downloading it and uploading it itself. And if you're able to react faster than the real C2 server, then you are able to, at least in theory, to hijack the session. There are a few downsides, however. Uh, first one being that uh, the same Google Drive account can be used by several um, infected machines, I mean, like in several different environments. So you might be able to uh, find clients outside your own environment. And the second one being that uh, you might leave traces for the threat actor to actually see that uh, you know what they are doing. And you're also saying that I have a C2 server implementation. The last one uh, being C2 sync calling. So that is basically the same as uh, C2 hijacking, just on a grander scale. So you want to not only do it locally for your environment, but you want to do it for the whole world. Um, that is very similar, but uh, has a few more requirements. So you still need your own C2 server implementation. Um, and for HTTP, you need to do domain sync calling. For Google Drive, it is basically the same as C2 hijacking, uh, but the most notable part, uh, if you want to actually do it successfully, 
is that you have to get the XOR keys from all curveback configurations that are uh, configured to talk to that C2. So even though they might share a C2, they might have different uh, XOR keys in their configuration. And in order to decrypt the traffic, you need to uh, have all of them. So that basically concludes uh, our talk. Uh, we're going to write a technical report and publish it. Uh, so watch out for that. Uh, however, uh, if you want to have a look yourself, uh, you can follow this QR code, and it will take you to a public sample that contains both curve load and curve back. All right. Thank you. So any questions? So using a hard-coded Google credentials and a hard-coded Google Drive ID seems very easy for Google to be able to disrupt this operation. Did they have any methods for either failback, changing their credentials? Were you able to just go to Google and say, this is a threat actor, shut them down? You know, how did that whole piece work? Um, so uh, at least the first part was if they have the ability to change the configuration, right? And that is embedded into the functionality of the core part of Coreback. You are able to update the configuration, and it will be stored on disk, and that will be used once it's loaded again. Uh, so that one is easy. Um, regarding the second part about uh, Google being able to find it, uh, I would believe so. If you read the Mandian blog post, you will see that they have collaborated with the Google Tag Team. Uh, and they also have a lot of information that is impossible for us to provide, because I, I'm guessing that they used the telemetry from, uh, from Google to actually determine which, uh, who the victims were and so on. So uh, you could possibly go to them. Uh, I can't remember if we did or not um, by myself, but yeah. More questions? <laughs> no more questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.